And this is the story of the resurrection that never gets preached on Resurrection Sunday. Seriously, most of the time we go with some of the other gospels because the other ones sound pretty excited that Jesus has been raised from the dead. This one ends weirdly. Like it's a bizarre ending. And Christians for almost 2,000 years have struggled with this ending, so much so that there is a history of adding on to the end of it and creating additional alternative endings because it makes us so uncomfortable. And so here is my goal this morning. I, I want to help us hear story of the resurrection from Mark's gospel as the very first hearers might have. And I hope that allows this text to speak to us in a fresh way this morning. And so, so let's do this. A young man dressed in a white robe said to the women, go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. And they went out and fled from the tomb for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Who is this they who fled and trembled and said nothing because they were afraid? Our, our passage opens by telling us, right? It was Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome. Three women, Mary, another Mary, and Salome. Uh, they've, they've been waiting until the Sabbath is over so that they could come and they could prepare Jesus' body for its final burial. And this is, actually isn't the first time that we've heard about these three women. Uh, just one chapter earlier, as Jesus hung on the cross, he cried out and he took his last breath. And there, looking on from a distance, were these three women, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, the younger, and of Joseph, and Salome. Mary, another Mary, and Salome. Uh, notice the three women are the same. Except in this earlier passage, uh, we learn a couple of extra details. The, the other Mary has a bonus son that we didn't know about, Joseph. And, and Mary's son, James, is apparently the younger. As readers of these names, right, almost 2,000 years later after Mark was written, it's really easy for us to just sort of pass over them without much attention. We don't know these people, and so we just kind of move on. But I want to suggest to you that there is actually something really important about the naming of these women here. That it's, it's not an accident that Mark reports the young man in white saying, go tell his disciples, and Peter. Peter is named on purpose, and so are the Marys and Salome. So let's try to figure out, right, what, what's so special about these women? Well, in Mark 15, 40, it is the first time Mark names two of the three women. Mary Magdalene and Salome are mentioned for the first time in this passage, but Mary the mother of James and Joseph has actually already been named once before in the book. Back in chapter six, uh, Jesus had, been, had taken his disciples back to his hometown of Nazareth where he was teaching. And the people who knew Jesus, who grew up with Jesus, they were astonished by his teaching and his wisdom and his power. And you know what? They were confused at what they saw in Jesus. And so they asked, is this not the son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph? Mary, the mother of James, the younger, and of Joseph, is Mary, the mother of Jesus. Mary's mother was there at the cross. She's still there in verse 47 when Jesus had been sealed away in the tomb. Mark tells us that Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, also the mother of Jesus, saw where he was laid. And then 
She was there again when the Sabbath was over, one of the first to come at the tomb when the stone had been rolled away and a young man in a white robe began to talk to them. She was there with Mary Magdalene and with Salome, who Mark tells us followed Jesus and ministered to him. Sent, and they had been doing this, following Jesus and ministering to him all the way back since they were in Galilee. So these three women, they have been with Jesus for a long time now. They, they've served him as an essential part of his, his support team. Not once, actually, are any of Jesus' male followers uh, said to have been ministering to Jesus, right? Because mostly, as we've read in Mark so far, They've just been causing problems for Jesus. He does most of the ministering to them. But Mark, he introduces uh, these women to us and presents them as kind of the last standing of all of Jesus' followers. Everyone else is gone, but these women remain. (laughs) Until Mark puts them all on blast with his very last breath, right? He he calls them out by name, Mary, the other Mary in Salome. And you can hear Mark's question under the surface, right? Like, like you, you know those women who were there with Jesus at the end, you know, the same ones who were still there after the end. Do you know what they did? They found the empty tomb. Like, they met a young man dressed in white, probably an angel. And, and the man told them that Jesus had been raised from the dead. They were the first ones to hear this message. And, and, they told, and the man told them that Jesus was going to go and meet them and the disciples in Galilee. And so they needed to go, go and tell the disciples and Peter. And they, they went in and, and they didn't go. They didn't tell everyone. No, right? Like they fled, trembling and astonished, we're told. And they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. I don't know if anyone has ever, like, not exactly changed the way that you hear a story in the Bible, like, forever. <laughs> but I might not ever be able to hear this passage the same way again after um, having my nephew Jack with me for the last several months. Yeah, Jack, I'm talking about you, buddy. Um, Because Jack wakes up pretty early in the morning, and so he and I are often awake together because I'm also an early riser. And sometimes Jack wakes up a little grumpy. He's not quite ready to see me. I I might not be his favorite. His mom is, right? I get it. I I can be a lot in the morning. Like, it's hard to imagine, I'm sure. but, But Aaron, not liking some of the things that, that Jack sometimes says to me in the mornings, would tell Jack, Jack, if, if you can't be kind, you don't have to say anything. So when Jack isn't ready to be kind, uh, he'll come downstairs and he'll look at me. Make sure we make eye contact with a closed mouth and sort of hum. Hmm, 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 hmm. And then he'll, he'll whisper to me, I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> Every time I've read our passage over the last few weeks, I get to, they said nothing to anyone, and I can't help but picture the women with Jack's closed mouth humming with a little whisper, I'm not saying anything to anyone. Maybe that'll ruin the reading of this passage for you as well. But this is how I experience this story now. Why? Why would Mark tell us the names of these women? Like, why would he call them out like this? We actually know that Mark is fully capable of telling an anonymous story. Back when Jesus was arrested in the garden, Mark told us that they all left him, left Jesus, they fled. And a young man, anonymous, we don't have a name, followed him. 
with nothing but a linen cloth about his body and the authority seized him and he left the linen cloth and he ran away naked. This is a crazy story in the gospels. Everyone ran away. But Mark is clearly capable of sparing this young man the public shame of everyone knowing just who it was who ran away naked. He lets this young man remain anonymous. He can do this, but Mary, no, the other Mary and Salome, they don't get to be anonymous. Everyone knows they were the women who arrived at the tomb and ran away afraid. It's messed up. To figure out what Mark is doing, I, I want to take a quick look at two other people named in these last chapters of Mark's gospel. So in chapter 15, verse 21, we, we learn that a, a man named Simon of Cyrene was made to carry Jesus' cross for him when Jesus was too weak. And he's described as Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. And then in verse 53, still chapter 15, we're introduced to Joseph of Arimathea. We're told that he is a respected member of the council. Two men are introduced to the story. And in both cases, some explanation is given, right, as to who they are. Like, we're, we're told where they both come from. Like, we're told who Simon's kids are. That's an interesting detail, right? And we're told Joseph's, Joseph's place in the community as a community leader in the council. And now think for a second about the worst storytellers in your life. The people who just, they tell stories that are just really hard to listen to. Why are they hard to listen to? Because when they tell stories, often they start using names as though you already know who these people are or why they're important to the story. No explanation of who they are. And, and for the really bad story, I'm sorry if this is you, right? For the worst storytellers, sometimes you'll just give names that actually have nothing to do with the story you're telling. Because we don't know the people in Mark's gospel personally, it can feel like Mark is doing the same thing, like he's a bad storyteller. But notice, there are actually two different kinds of people named in Mark's gospel, right? There are the people like Simon and Joseph, and then there are the people like Alexander and Rufus, Mary Magdalene, James the Younger, and Joseph, and Salome. These are people who don't need context, right? There's no explanation given because there's no explanation needed, right? If I start telling you a story about Janet or Sajin or Derry or Bob, if I start telling you a story about any of them, you don't need any additional details, right? You know who I'm talking about. But if I'm gonna start telling you a story about Tom, I might need to distinguish Epperly or Bashada. So that like Mary, right? We just need to distinguish between the different Toms that we know. When Mark refers to James, the younger, right? It's clear to us that Mark's audience is familiar with two different Jameses. Jameses, James, James, I don't know whatever is the right one. That's what I said. Um, and everyone seems to just know, right, that the younger one is Jesus's brother. So, so he can refer to James the younger, have everyone on the same page, and then just keep moving on, right? It, it only took one word to distinguish between two people. It, like, if I, if I say, Pastor David, right? You know I'm not talking about any other Davids in our church. If I say David Moore, you know I'm not talking about Pastor David. And, and this might all feel a bit unnecessary, random to you, but it's actually really important to get a sense of how naming is working in the storytelling in this passage because we need to understand that Mary, 
that the other Mary and that Salome are known personally to the audience that Mark is writing to. We know that because Mark, unlike everyone, so many others in the gospel, he doesn't explain them. He simply distinguishes between Marys as though everybody knows the difference. So it's clear who he's talking about. And, and actually Salome gets zero additional context. So he can say Salome and everybody's like, yeah, Salome. See, actually in a different gospel, written to a different audience, Salome appears, but she's not named because that name wouldn't mean anything to this other gospel writer's audience. Instead, she's actually described in the other gospel as, as the mother of the sons of Zebedee, right? That sort of cues us that that audience, they know Zebedee's sons, but they don't know Salome. These gospel writers are good storytellers. They know their audiences and we should assume that. And so Mark names Salome with no context because with Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, the younger and Joseph, Salome is known to Mark's audience, which is like, oh, interesting point, Curtis. Why do I care? <laughs> Fair question. Here's why, if Mark is writing his gospel, 20, to 30 years after these events. And here's where I need you to start to imagine with me. Imagine how Mark's storytelling might impact his audience. So imagine 35 people, which would be one of the larger churches in the ancient world in the first century, 35 people gathered together Mark has finished writing his gospel and this house church, these 35 people are gonna be the very first people to hear it read aloud. It's an exciting moment. But what if, what if Salome or the Marys are physically present and part of that 35 people in this, this church family? Or, or, or maybe, Salome and the Marys, maybe they travel through town on a regular basis as part of their ministry. Or, or what if these 35 people have been disciplined, have been discipled with stories of Salome, stories of the Marys, stories of their hospitality and their ministry and, and their boldness in proclaiming the gospel. What if these 35 people who are gathered to hear Mark's gospel, what if they know these women, what if they know them personally? Like knowing their character, knowing their faithfulness. Can you imagine what these 35 people are thinking as they listen to the story Mark is telling, as they hear that these women were there at the end of Jesus's life when he took his final breath, right? Like you have to imagine, they're nodding along with their heads with the story going, amen, of course these women would be there at the end. And the same goes for the burial, right? As these women, they watch where Jesus's body is laid. And then of course they are there, they show up to prepare his body for bur burial and everyone else is gone. Right, like the crowd listening doesn't need any convincing. Everything they know about these women confirms that they would have been faithful to the end. And then Mark finishes. The women have been told what to do by this young man. They are to tell the disciples and Peter that Jesus has risen and will meet them in Galilee. And we read, and they went out and fled from the tomb for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. Knowing these women, they live among you. This story, this ending would feel incredibly jolting, almost unexplainable. It reminds me, actually, there are a few of you on a regular basis who do this. Whenever I share a story about kind of who I was as a teenager, who I was before I met Jesus, uh, 
who, those of you who didn't know me then, who know me now, who go, ah, it's always weird to hear those stories. There's something that doesn't quite sit right. There's some sort of gap, and I don't know how you got from there to here. The picture that Mark paints of these women, these terrified women who run in fear, who cower in silence, would feel like Mark is talking about totally different women that, that this community doesn't even recognize. But they would most likely still be alive and maybe even present there. Or at least people who knew them personally and have for those 20 to 30 years would. And they would say, yep, Mark's got it exactly right. We had no idea what to do when we showed up. We weren't ready for that. Yeah, yeah, Jesus told us. We didn't understand. We didn't have the faith. To Mark's audience, right, the gospel, it ends with a mystery. How do these women, Mary, the other Mary, and Salome, how do these women who run and hide and refuse to say anything, how do they become the Mary, the other Mary, and Salome that the early church would come to lift up as powerful in the Holy Spirit, as wise and bold leaders who proclaim the gospel? How do they make this move? Right? The first people listening to Mark's gospel know they know by experience that this final verse is not the end of the story for these women, right? These women, the disciples and Peter, they will all go on to see, to meet the risen Jesus for themselves. And this will change everything, right? They will encounter resurrection power, the, the resurrection power of God at work in a dead body, a body they saw hanging from a cross and put into a tomb. How, how, do, how do we know this? Because there's a church that exists to hear the story that Mark has written. A church exists 20, 30 years after these events for Mark to write his gospel too because these women, the disciples and Peter, they didn't stay hiding, they didn't stay quiet. No, because the very same power, the very same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead began to work in them. The, the women, the disciples and Peter, they, they began to die to the life that they had been living. They, they, they began to die to life as they understood it. And they began to understand that if God could raise the dead, then they needed to begin rethinking everything they thought they knew. And it turns out in the presence of the risen Jesus, they were given a new sight, a new sight that as we just read Mark's gospel together over the last eight weeks, they clearly cannot get on their own, right? They can't muscle up understanding. They can't think hard enough to go, oh, I get what Jesus is saying. They've tried and they've failed miserably again and again. They can't make themselves see the kingdom of God. They can't make themselves see what Jesus is trying to teach them. No, no, no. They are like the blind men in Mark's gospel. Those who unable to see need to be given sight by God. The women... The women had been healed with the resurrection power of God. If you want to know how we get from the end of Mark's gospel to 20 and 30 years later, the life that people are seeing in front of them, the lives that people are seeing in the women in front of them, that's the only explanation. These women have been healed and given sight they, they weren't persuaded by solid logic. 
They weren't convinced by, by their own profound wisdom. They now understood because God had opened their eyes. They had seen the risen Jesus and now know what it all means because they have been healed of their blindness. And so now as new creations, as people raised to do life, they have spent decades of their lives with their eyes fixed on Jesus, seeing him more and more clearly. They have spent decades learning to trust Jesus, practicing obedience, learning to love in the way that Jesus loves. And, and here they are. They stand before a church, listening to the story of who they were. so that this church in front of them might see Jesus and respond to his invitation to them as well. Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. And guess what? None of us do that unless our eyes have been opened. It makes no sense. It's crazy. The cross is a weapon of torture. It's an execution element. Nobody goes, sign me up for that. We, we don't. There's nothing that would compel us to do that except the resurrection power of God showing up in front of us, teaching us, helping us to see that if we will die with Christ, we will be raised with him. And it is only as we die with Christ that we might begin to be raised to new life. If your life has been marked by a fear that keeps you from following Jesus, this morning, my prayer for you has been that you will see the risen Jesus and that he will open your eyes. That's the only way any of us will see.